Welcome to Worth Quoting, a program sponsored by the Women's Center at Florida Community College. Our special guest who is worth quoting is Dr. Louise McCants, who is the author of Woman Change. Louise, can you tell us a little bit about what is woman change? Thank you. Well, first I should tell you that title was dreamed up by my publisher. <laughs> I had wanted to call it Hard Choices. And he said, women don't want to think about hard choices. But woman change as a title means that women are changing their roles in our society. And I'd like to think they're deciding to become full citizens. That's wonderful. So those are the hard decisions that they're going to have to make. Yes, yes. What's the major point of, of your book? What, what do you want people to know? I want people to know that women have responsibility for their own lives, that each woman must decide for herself what she wants to accomplish with her life. And then she must learn to make decisions that will bring out the best that's in her, so that when she becomes her own true self, it'll be her best self. Okay. And what makes, what makes the book, why did you have to write the book? I suppose I wrote the book because I was Southern. Because I, because I was, I was brought up in Arkansas. Now that wasn't my fault, you understand. But I wrote the book because, as a Southern girl, I was conditioned that my first duty was to conform, to please other people, and to make choices that were socially acceptable. I believe in this brave new world to which we're going. Women can make choices that are not only socially acceptable, but also good choices for her. Well, the people who are going to be watching this, this uh, Worth Quoting program are going to be, I guess, Southern or at least know a lot of Southern women. Uh -huh. um, what makes Southerners special about, I mean, why is this, is this really for this audience? Well, it's not limited, of course, in its intention for, just for Southern women, but I, I do believe Southern women are conditioned a bit more than our women of the North that their first duty is to conform to all the societal expectations and the social codes. And of course the economy has changed all over this country and most of our social codes have economic bases. And what's the economic basis that's new and different? We are now living, of course, in a world which is rapidly rushing into a technological age. Most Southern women are conforming, I believe, and I certainly did, to a code that had its origin a hundred years ago, perhaps further back in the industrial age. And even more recently, the code that was totally appropriate for 1957 is not appropriate now. In 1957, this country had 40% of the industrial output of the world. Now we have about 20%. So women work. Women must work. We have to pick up our share of the obligations. What about the, are we going back to pre-World War I then, where women were working as well? I mean, they, they may not have been working in paid jobs, but they were certainly working on the farms. They were working, and they were working hard. And they were not apologizing for working then, because they knew how significant their work was. They worked to do the wash, and to put the food on the table, and to can, and to make their own clothes, and to raise the children. And often they did this on wood-burning stoves, the cooking. Women didn't apologize for working in those days. They knew they were the, at least, their work was at least half of the production that went on in the household. I think women nowadays measure their lives in terms of those easy years in the 50s and 60s and 70s when the men in this country made so much money in the industrial workforce that we had for a few years, 20, 30, the luxury of women being able to stay home with labor-saving appliances and play bridge in the afternoons. That's true, and they were guiltless in those days. They were guiltless. Now we've got work and guilt. <laughs> well, it's a poor combination. That's true. I think we could turn the tables around by feeling very proud. We were talking earlier about pioneering ancestors. Those women didn't apologize for working. They knew they had to work. But do you see women today as pioneers? I do. I believe we're going to pioneer in a technological age. A woman who is an engineer and who is a good engineer nowadays is not working out there on the production line hefting big blocks of steel. She's working with a computer. She's working with ideas. 
It doesn't require physical strength. Sorry, well, is everything open to women then? I believe it is. I really, except maybe pro football. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to be any good at that. <laughs> but, well, the guys can't be the cheerleaders either. I suppose <laughs> that's the other part of that. <laughs> maybe not. But in jobs that require intelligence and creativity, I believe women have exactly the same chance as men now if they pick up the responsibility that goes with it. Okay. And, and they mean, that means they're going to have to prepare themselves, they're going to have to take it seriously, and they're going to have to realize that they're going to be working 25, 30 years. They might as well work at something they're good at. Well, is it a myth then to think that you're going to stay home with your children and never work? Nine out of ten women in this country are going to work. Uh, with current statistics, it may get higher in the future. And of these women, the majority are going to work more than 25 years. Mm. It's a myth. One out of ten women nowadays has the luxury of staying at home. And that may not be in her best interest. The very talented woman who's staying at home and not using those talents, and I believe that volunteer work is productive, just like paid work, but the talented woman ought to be working at something because this country needs it. Well, what about the, the need for child care that women should stay home and take care of the children? What, how does that fit into this? It's not easy. And I go back to the pioneer woman. My great-great-grandmother who was spinning the cloth and working in the garden and carrying water for the well, you think she was apologizing to her child because she was not devoting her time exclusively to him? No. She knew that this work was necessary for, a, for her to put bread on his table. Working women now, I believe, have much the same situation. They just don't recognize it. We do need better child care. Goodness knows we need better child care. We, I think, ought to have nurseries attached to corporate locations so that women can bring their children with them and put them in the nursery right there close to where they work. We ought to have better cooperative arrangements. I would like to see you tell me that you have a nanny program right here in I'd your I'd like college. to be able to tell you that we did too. <laughs> I wish you did. This country needs that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. There are always people who are so splendid at the care of little children that that ought to be their major work and their major talent. But not everybody has to do it. Not everybody has to do it and not everybody's good at it. Well, The that's fact true. that I'm good at giving birth and I have three children doesn't necessarily mean that I was the best person in the world to bring them up when they were young, though I certainly tried and enjoyed it. I'm not against it. I'm just saying we don't all have the equal distribution of talents. I think that's true, but we talk about choices. I mean, you said this would be, you know, hard choices. Um, what kind of choices, how do, how do women get off dead center and make those choices? First, they must realize they have an obligation to make them because you are responsible for your own self. Your own soul and the final analysis is your responsibility. And your own needs, I believe, are your own responsibility if you're a full citizen. If you're going to be a dependent all your life, then that's somewhat different. But if you're going to elect full citizenship, then you have a responsibility for making the best choice you can in order to make your maximum contribution to the world you live in. So you say, first, what talents do I have? And then you say, how could I best be using them? And third is, what options do I have? And which is the best? Psychologically, financially, usually when there's some risk, there's some reward. No risk, usually there's very little reward. Well, you've got a lot of people who can hear what you've said, but don't know how to get how to even get started. Well, that really is why I wrote that book, because <laughs> the, a method of personal decision making can be taken right out of the Harvard Business School approach to business decision making. You look at the facts, you look at the assumptions, you look at the options, you measure the payoffs, the risks, and you take the best option. And you can do that for personal choices just as they can be done for business choices. And of course it's hard. Nobody ever said life was easy. Or those who have thought it was easy have sometimes 
found it. Well, is it harder having all the choices or going back to the 50s mentality, which is child rearing, nursing, teaching? What was the third one? I guess that is a, that those are three. I can't uh -huh. remember exactly. But um, there are more choices, so it makes it harder, doesn't it? Makes it, it much harder. The more options you have, it, it's like choosing in a candy store. If you've got a quarter to spend and it'll buy one piece of candy and you have 12 to choose from. And you see, m women make a mistake, I think. We think so long as we don't make a choice that all options are, o are open. I think that's very well believed, yes. But to choose not to choose is a choice. You've lost them all if you can't decide on one. How do you sell that point, though? I mean, how, when people feel like they've got all their options open and they haven't made a choice, they can do anything they want. In fact, they're not doing anything. Well, I believe life itself sells that point, but usually too late. Education, of course, is how you sell the point. Mm -hmm. I, I think the purpose of education is to turn people into ethical, responsible citizens. And to me, that means citizens who are responsible for their own choices and who make good, moral choices. Okay. You've been a dean at a community college in higher yes. education, and you've seen people come back to schools and things like that. Is that part of your inspiration for spreading yes. the word? Yes. I cannot tell you how many hundreds of women I have seen who have looked to some authority figure for permission to make a choice to make a choice in their own best interest, to make a choice that would be good for them. And they come up and they say to somebody else, what do you think I ought to do? Nobody knows your own innermost feelings as you do. But I wrote that book primarily because I wanted women to realize that they, better than anyone else, uh, they know what, what their inclinations are, they know what they want. Sometimes it takes them a long time to be willing to articulate it. I've been a dean, and I coordinate the deans of instruction now, and they're all men, and they've gotten used to it. <laughs> I always say to the extent deans are willing to be coordinated, since you are one. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Coordination doesn't come readily to a dean. <laughs> it's not. A, I guess it's a learned skill. I think. Or unlearned, whichever. Unlearned, yes. Okay, well, people are, women are asking permission. Now, men aren't having to do this? Men know from the time they're two years old or three that they're going to work for a living. Okay. Women were socialized when I was growing up, and many are still socialized, to the notion that once they get married, it is their husband's duty to support them and they can decide whether or not they want to work. Men don't have those illusions. They know that nobody else will support them. But women many times work their husband's way through school. They do indeed, and I worked my husband's way through school, and that's a choice I freely made. I was proud and happy to do it. Should that change? I think not. I think marriage is a partnership, and the husband certainly should feel obligated to help his wife work her way through school if that's something that she wants to do. And on the other hand, if, if she's unwilling to work to help him, there's something wrong already there. It probably goes a lot deeper than just the need for education. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing wrong with her supporting him because the opposite is true as well. Yes, I think in a viable working partnership, there has to be support, financial, psychological, social. Mm -hmm. Well, many times women invest in their husbands, they don't invest in themselves. And I think that is short-sighted. And I think it's happened over and over and over in this country. And again, it is because this illusion that women have that they marry for the rest of their lives and that they will work two or three years. The facts are, I hesitate to say this because it's such a grim statistic. Mm -hmm. But women now in their 30s, that decade, six who are married, six out of 10 marriages will result in divorce. Those are governmental statistics. And it's not anything we should any of us be proud of. But those are the current statistics. Well, some people wonder if um, divorce begets working or if working begets divorce.
You got any insight on that? I think they're both symptoms and neither is an underlying cause. I think the cause is the economic situation in this country. We've lost our industrial base. We're going into an information society. It has, its leading edge has to be technological. Women are gonna to have to work because there's so many service jobs over here that don't pay very much. The standard of living that we used to have can't be supported on the 20% of the output when we used to have 40. So both marriage and divorce uh, and the economic situations that result the working both those things have economic bases. But won't it ever get better? I mean, can, oh. you, can you afford to hold out for the good times again, and are oh. we going back to the... Oh, I think the good times are coming. As soon as every talented adult in this country, both men and women, as soon as we recognize that we ought to be working, as soon as we use our talents to major advantage, we can roll this forward into a, this country into a leading position. When the talented woman who is really good at whatever it is she's good at, whether it's music, art, medicine, engineering, business, law, whatever. When that 50% of the population, when those people really start using their talents well, we can move forward. But the working percentage, though, the unemployment rate and that kind of thing, women have been blamed for men's unemployment. Well, I think people who say that lose sight of the fact that the whole job structure has shifted. Women are not to blame for men having lost their jobs in the industrialized sector, these uh, blue collar jobs out in the factories. Those jobs were lost primarily through competition with foreign nations and because of automation. Neither of those is a feminine problem. Now, when men and women start competing for service jobs, these five or six dollars an hour jobs, women are not to blame for the jobs being out there. And a woman who has a need to eat has, I think, the same right to a job as a man. I think their needs are equal. Well, certainly a single woman parent head of household has got the same sort of responsibilities as any man has. Indeed she does, and a woman married to a man who is unemployed has the same responsibility to go out and put bread on the table. But your book is directed to women. Yes, it is. Because I really feel that men recognize their responsibilities to work and to, and to work at jobs which use their major talents. Men expect to work. Okay, so this is to get women moving? to get them moving in directions in which they'll do their best. Not to go move toward mediocrity, but to move toward something that will fulfill them, make them happy, and at the same time make a contribution to this world. I think when we use our major talents, we're happy. When we don't, I think we get dissatisfied and morose and uh, bitter. So we're looking at careers, not jobs. Yes, we are. And I think raising a child is career. Don't misunderstand me. If it's a luxury you can afford. And if it's something you do well. Otherwise? Otherwise, I think you better employ yourself more productively. And I know that sounds harsh. I don't, I don't mean it to sound as though women should not have children. Of course, having children is a wonderful thing. And I have three. I simply mean that Women may have to have children and raise children and at the same time be engineers and lawyers and musicians and drafts men and women and computer programmers. Well, what's keeping the myth going? If in fact the world has changed and things aren't going to go back and... Oh, the Cinderella myth is keeping it going. Every woman in her secret heart has been brought up on this lovely notion that Prince Charming will sweep her off her feet and take her away from drudgery and poverty, and that all she has to do is be darling. Okay. Well, I've always wondered where Happily Ever After went. I mean, after the marriage, <laughs> what happens next? The book ends, right? And that's really the beginning of everybody's, well, can be the beginning of people's lives. And nobody ever quarrels with the notion that Cinderella is expected to fall madly in love with the prince. Of course she falls in love with him. He's rich and he's a prince. Now, is he going to be nice for the next 50 years? Who knows? That's true. Well, to get women in touch with their skills, what do you recommend? 
or what their talents, I guess talents is a much better word. Well, that's very difficult. We have excellent tests to measure IQ. We can tell who has a good IQ and who doesn't have a good IQ. We don't have a test that will determine who's going to be a good entrepreneur and who's not. We don't have a test to determine who's going to be good at making money and who's not. We don't even have a test to differentiate for artistic talent. So this almost has to be a series of counseling, of probing questions under a skilled counselor. It's not a pencil and paper job. Only IQ, can, in my judgment, can be determined readily from a pencil and paper deal. So it takes counseling, it ha takes education, and it takes s searching. Sometimes it's trial and error. I've had my share of errors already. <laughs> Too many. Can you get in touch with what you're good at just by knowing, by looking at your past and what you've enjoyed? Is that one way of looking at it? I think so. I really believe, and it was, I believe, Kay Patricia Cross who said this 20, 25 years ago, that talents come in three major categories, talent for people, talent for ideas, talent for things, by which she meant mechanical competency. And that most of us have two out of the three, and usually a conspicuous lack of one of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My case, I can't drive a car and chew gum at the same time. Not a mechanical person. No. Oh dear. No. So you have to first, you have to sort out what it is you can't do well. I think also you have to ask yourself whether you're a leader or a follower or an independent. And I know that's situational. But still, there's some bedrock personality in there. Okay. Any other pointers there on? Because that I think people can probably do an inventory for themselves. I think they can. Then I think you have to pay some attention to the goal setting. You have to say, when I'm 35, what do I really want to be doing? When I'm 40, what would I like to have accomplished? When I'm 60, and I'm 63 now, so I, you just need to see, say, when I have spent all those years working, what do I want to have to show for it? What do I want to be remembered for? I think that's true. We have um, the Women's Center at Florida Community College, yes. which is a valuable resource. And many women have gone through the same way that you've talked about. We do have some pencil and paper tests that, that they're able to use. But we also have a counselor that helps people make decisions. Uh -huh. But in fact, many times people come and they say, well, what should I do? Just like anybody says. Yes. Else. yes. <laughs> what do you say when somebody says, what should I do? Well, I say. We have to look at the job market. We have to look at the co coming economic trends. We have to make decisions on what will lie ahead in this country, not what has already passed and not what we wish would be out there. And then if this person has, if the person has a burning dream, and I think that's very rare, I think maybe five or 10 out of 100 have this burning dream. If I meet anybody with a burn who's on fire for something, I I think the best thing you can do is get out of the way and let them go do it and, and be happy. Mm -hmm. But for the rest, I say it's going to take study, it's going to take time, and I think it's going to take a lot of research in the library. I think you're going to have to read magazines. I think news, I'm not talking about true confessions. I'm talking about Fortune, U.S. News and World Report. You're going to have to read articles about what's going on in the world. You're going to have to catch a glimpse of what you wish you could do. But still, you have to change jobs, too. Yes, you do. And sometimes you have to wake, work your way up through the ranks. Often, nearly all of us have to work our way up through the ranks. And you have to, usually, in, this, in these times, it takes education. The days of rags to riches, uh, those days were based on an industrial age. It happens now. Uh, Colonel Saunders is case in point. Mm -hmm. But for most people, it's based on some kind of knowledge and ability that's acquired through education. So you recommend that people figure out what they want to do? Well, with the help of skilled counseling, if they don't know, and then that they invest some time in themselves and some money. They go to school. And it irks me to see women shy away from taking hard courses. Life is just very seldom gone along on an easy path for anybody. Well, of course, it's not easy to, to work, go to school, and raise a family. And it wasn't easy for the pioneer woman to spin her own thread and weave her own cloth and 
make her own soap and carry her own water and doctor the sick child using herbs. And, and be roots. alone in the middle of the wilderness, I suppose. That's right. It does That's sort of, right. decision making for career sort of pales by comparison when you look at that kind of an alternative. It really does. And we've been spoiled, I think, because of this wonderful economic base we've had for about the past 30 years. So what we need is some courage, maybe. Exactly. And some information. And grit. Grit. Okay. I think grit and grace can exist simultaneously. I don't think a woman is less graceful because she has grit in her backbone. No. I think that's probably true. And what about asking permission? How do you quit doing that? <laughs> How do you grow up? So if you're the mother of your children and they do it, you should be able to be the adult? I would hope so. I think that women have to give themselves permission to be adult. Somehow women often think they're less appealing if they are fully adult. And if they are, then that's a high price to pay for appeal. That's true. And in fact, the statistics say that we have to, we're going to end up working anyway. We're going to work anyhow. Most of us will be widowed by the time we're The 60. odds are that a woman at 60 will be alone. Okay. And the woman who's made miserable choices in her 20s and 30s and 40s is going to be in bad shape in her 60s and 70s and That's true. And well, women are um, getting to be the, the new poor. And one way to prevent that, I suppose, is to make some of the decisions that you've recommended. And to do some hard things, to shoulder their burdens and walk. And walk forward, not slide backwards. Okay. And to stand on their own two feet, to take their to future take their in their lumps, hands. To take their lumps and realize they'll grow from whatever pain is involved. Well, staying still is probably um, being lost, so you need to is. move ahead. Well, Louise, I, I think I've really enjoyed reading the book and talking with you, and I hope that the, our viewers have as well. Thank you. Um, this is Carol Miner with Worth Quoting from the Florida Community College Women's Center, and we'd like to thank Dr. Louise McCants, who is the author of Women Change, for sharing some thoughts with us. And um, also, I recommend that you read her book because it's got some wonderful pointers in it. So go ahead and take that next step. Thank you.